Chapter 7 They Return Some complicated game had been playing up and down the hillside all the afternoon. What it was and exactly how the players had sided, Lucy was slow to discover. Mr. Eager had met them with a questioning eye. Charlotte had repulsed him with much small talk. Mr. Emerson, seeking his son, was told whereabouts to find him. Mr. Beebe, who wore the heated aspect of a neutral, was bidden to collect the factions for the return home. There was a general sense of groping and bewilderment. Pan had been amongst them, not the great god Pan, who has been buried these two thousand years, but the little god Pan, who presides over social contretemps and unsuccessful picnics. Mr. Beebe had lost everyone, and had consumed in solitude the tea-basket which he had brought up as a pleasant surprise. Miss Lavish had lost Miss Bartlett, Lucy had lost Mr. Eager, Mr. Emerson had lost George, Miss Bartlett had lost a Mackintosh square, Phaethon had lost the game. That last fact was undeniable. He climbed onto the box, shivering, with his collar up, prophesying the swift approach of bad weather. "'Let us go immediately,' he told them. "'The signorina will walk.' "'All the way. He will be ours,' said Mr. Beebe. "'Apparently. I told him it was unwise.' He would look no one in the face. Perhaps defeat was particularly mortifying for him. He alone had played skillfully, using the whole of his instinct, while the others had used scraps of their intelligence. He alone had divined what things were and what he wished them to be. He alone had interpreted the message that Lucy had received five days before from the lips of a dying man. Persephone, who spends half her life in the grave, she could interpret it also. Not so these English. They gain knowledge slowly and perhaps too late. The thoughts of a cab-driver, however just, seldom affect the lives of his employers. He was the most competent of Miss Bartlett's opponents, but infinitely the least dangerous. Once back in the town, he and his insight and his knowledge would trouble English ladies no more. Of course it was most unpleasant. She had seen his black head in the bushes. He might make a tavern story out of it. But after all, what have we to do with taverns? Real menace belongs to the drawing-room. It was of drawing-room people that Miss Bartlett thought as she journeyed downwards towards the fading sun. Lucy sat beside her. Mr. Eager sat opposite, trying to catch her eye. He was vaguely suspicious. They spoke of Alessio Baldovinetti. Rain and darkness came on together. The two ladies huddled together under an inadequate parasol. There was a lightning flash, and Miss Lavish, who was nervous, screamed from the carriage in front. At the next flash, Lucy screamed also. Mr. Eager addressed her professionally. Courage, Miss Honeychurch, courage and faith. If I might say so, there is something almost blasphemous in this horror of the elements. Are we seriously to suppose that all these clouds, all this immense electrical display, is simply called into existence to extinguish you or me? No, of course. Even from the scientific standpoint the chances against our being struck are enormous. The steel knives, the only articles which might attract the current, are in the other carriage. And, in any case, we are infinitely safer than if we were walking. Courage! Courage and faith! Under the rug, Lucy felt the kindly pressure of her cousin's hand. At times our need for a sympathetic gesture is so great that we care not what exactly it signifies or how much we may have to pay for it afterwards. Miss Bartlett, by this timely exercise of her muscles, gained more than she would have got in hours of preaching or cross-examination. She renewed it when the two carriages stopped, half into Florence. "'Mr. Eager,' called Mr. Beebe, "'we want your assistance. Will you interpret for us?' "'George!' cried Mr. Emerson. "'Ask your driver which way George went. The boy may lose his way. He may be killed.' "'Go, Mr. Eager,' said Miss Bartlett. "'Don't ask our driver. Our driver is no help. Go and support poor Mr. Beebe. He is nearly demented.' "'He may be killed,' cried the old man. "'He may be killed.' "'Typical behavior," said the chaplain as he quitted the carriage. "'In the presence of reality that kind of person invariably breaks down.' "'What does he know?' whispered Lucy, as soon as they were alone. 
Charlotte, how much does Mr. Eager know? Nothing, dearest, he knows nothing. But— She pointed at the driver. He knows everything. Dearest, had we better? Shall I? She took out her purse. It is dreadful to be entangled with low-class people. He saw it all. Tapping Phaethon's back with her guidebook, she said, Silenzio! and offered him a franc. Va bene. He replied, and accepted it, as well this ending to his day as any. But Lucy, a mortal maid, was disappointed in him. There was an explosion up the road. The storm had struck the overhead wire of the tram-line, and one of the great supports had fallen. If they had not stopped, perhaps they might have been hurt. They chose to regard it as a miraculous preservation, and the floods of love and sincerity, which fructify every hour of life, burst forth in tumult. They descended from the carriages, they embraced each other. It was as joyful to be forgiven past unworthinesses as to forgive them. For a moment they realized vast possibilities of good. The older people recovered quickly. In the very height of their emotion they knew it to be unmanly or unladylike. Miss Lavish calculated that, even if they had continued, they would not have been caught in the accident. Mr. Eager mumbled a temperate prayer. But the drivers, through miles of dark squalid road, poured out their souls to the dryads and the saints, and Lucy poured out hers to her cousin. "'Charlotte, dear Charlotte, kiss me. Kiss me again. Only you can understand me. You warned me to be careful, and I—I I thought I was developing.' Do not cry, dearest. Take your time. I have been obstinate and silly. Worse than you know, far worse. Once by the river. Oh, but he isn't killed. He wouldn't be killed, would he? The thought disturbed her repentance. As a matter of fact, the storm was worst along the road, but she had been near danger, and so she thought it must be near to everyone. I trust not. One would always pray against that. He is really— I think he was taken by surprise, just as I was before. But this time I'm not to blame. I want you to believe that. I simply slipped into those violets. No, I want to be really truthful. I am a little to blame. I had silly thoughts. The sky, you know, was gold, and the ground all blue, and for a moment he looked like someone in a book. In a book? Heroes, gods, the nonsense of schoolgirls. And then? But, Charlotte, you know what happened then. Miss Bartlett was silent. Indeed, she had little more to learn. With a certain amount of insight she drew her young cousin affectionately to her. All the way back Lucy's body was shaken by deep sighs, which nothing could repress. "'I want to be truthful,' she whispered. "'It is so hard to be absolutely truthful.' "'Don't be troubled, dearest. Wait till you are calmer. We will talk it over before bedtime in my room.' So they re-entered the city with hands clasped. It was a shock to the girl to find how far emotion had ebbed in others. The storm had ceased, and Mr. Emerson was easier about his son. Mr. Beebe had regained good humour, and Mr. Eager was already snubbing Miss Lavish. Charlotte alone she was sure of. Charlotte, whose exterior concealed so much insight and love. The luxury of self-exposure kept her almost happy through the long evening. She thought not so much of what had happened as of how she should describe it. All her sensations, her spasms of courage, her moments of unreasonable joy, her mysterious discontent, should be carefully laid before her cousin. And together, in divine confidence, they would disentangle and interpret them all. At last, thought she, I shall understand myself. I shan't again be troubled by things that come out of nothing and mean I don't know what. Miss Allen asked her to play. She refused vehemently. Music seemed to her the employment of a child. She sat close to her cousin, who, with commendable patience, was listening to a long story about lost luggage. When it was over she capped it by a story of her own. Lucy became rather hysterical with the delay. In vain she tried to check, or at all events to accelerate, the tale. It was not till a late hour that Miss Bartlett had recovered her luggage and could say in her usual tone of gentle reproach, "'Well, dear, I at all events am ready for Bedfordshire. Come into my room and I will give a good brush to your hair.' With some solemnity the door was shut, and a cane chair placed for the girl. Then Miss Bartlett said, "'So what is to be done?' She was unprepared for the question. It had not occurred to her that she would have to do anything. 
a detailed exhibition of her emotions was all that she had counted upon. "'What is to be done? A point, dearest, which you alone can settle.' The rain was streaming down the black windows, and the great room felt damp and chilly. One candle burnt trembling on the chest of drawers close to Miss Bartlett's toque, which cast monstrous and fantastic shadows on the bolted door. A tram roared by in the dark, and Lucy felt unaccountably sad, though she had long since dried her eyes. She lifted them to the ceiling, where the griffins and bassoons were colourless and vague, the very ghosts of joy. "'It has been raining for nearly four hours,' she said at last. Miss Bartlett ignored the remark. "'How do you propose to silence him?' "'The driver.' "'My dear girl, no! Mr. George Emerson!' Lucy began to pace up and down the room. "'I don't understand,' she said at last. She understood very well, but she no longer wished to be absolutely truthful. "'How are you going to stop him talking about it?' "'I have a feeling that talk is a thing he will never do.' "'I, too, intend to judge him charitably. But unfortunately I have met the type before. They seldom keep their exploits to themselves.' "'Exploits!' cried Lucy, wincing under the horrible plural. Oh, my poor dear, did you suppose that this was his first? Come here and listen to me. I am only gathering it from his own remarks. Do you remember that day at lunch when he argued with Miss Allen that liking one person is an extra reason for liking another? Yes, said Lucy, whom at the time the argument had pleased. Well, I am no prude. There is no need to call him a wicked young man, but obviously he is thoroughly unrefined. Let us put it down to his deplorable antecedents and education, if you wish. But we are no farther on with our question. What do you propose to do?" An idea rushed across Lucy's brain, which, had she thought of it sooner and made it part of her, might have proved victorious. "'I propose to speak to him,' said she. Miss Bartlett uttered a cry of genuine alarm. "'You see, Charlotte, your kindness. I shall never forget it. But as you said, it is my affair, mine and his.' "'And you are going to implore him, to beg him to keep silence?' "'Certainly not. There would be no difficulty. Whatever you ask him he answers yes or no. Then it is over. I have been frightened of him, but now I am not one little bit.' "'But we fear him for you, dear. You are so young and inexperienced. You have lived among such nice people, that you cannot realise what men can be, how they can take a brutal pleasure in insulting a woman whom her sex does not protect and rally round. This afternoon, for example, if I had not arrived, what would have happened?" "'I can't think,' said Lucy gravely. Something in her voice made Miss Bartlett repeat her question, intoning it more vigorously. "'What would have happened if I hadn't arrived?' "'I can't think,' said Lucy again. "'When he insulted you, how would you have replied?' "'I hadn't time to think. You came.' "'Yes, but won't you tell me now what you would have done?' "'I should have—' She checked herself and broke the sentence off. She went up to the dripping window and strained her eyes into the darkness. She could not think what she would have done. "'Come away from the window, dear,' said Miss Bartlett. "'You will be seen from the road.' Lucy obeyed. She was in her cousin's power. She could not modulate out the key of self-abasement in which she had started. Neither of them referred again to her suggestion that she should speak to George and settle the matter, whatever it was, with him. Miss Bartlett became plaintive. Oh, for a real man! We are only two women—you and I. Mr. Beebe is hopeless. There is Mr. Eager, but you do not trust him. Oh, for your brother! He is young, but I know that his sister's insult would rouse in him a very lion. Thank God chivalry is not yet dead. There are still left some men who can reverence woman." As she spoke she pulled off her rings, of which she wore several, and ranged them upon the pincushion. Then she blew into her gloves and said, "'It'll be a push to catch the morning train, but we must try.' "'What train?' "'The train to Rome.' She looked at her gloves critically. The girl received the announcement as easily as it had been given. "'When does the train to Rome go?' "'At eight. "'Signora Bertolini would be upset.' "'We must face that,' said Miss Bartlett, not liking to say that she had given notice already. "'She will make us pay for a whole week's pension.' "'I expect she will. However, we shall be much more comfortable at the Vise's Hotel. Isn't afternoon tea given there for nothing?" "'Yes, but they pay extra for wine.' After this remark she remained motionless and silent. 
To her tired eyes Charlotte throbbed and swelled like a ghostly figure in a dream. They began to sort their clothes for packing, for there was no time to lose if they were to catch the train to Rome. Lucy, when admonished, began to move to and fro between the rooms, more conscious of the discomforts of packing by candlelight than of a subtler ill. Charlotte, who was practical without ability, knelt by the side of an empty trunk, vainly endeavouring to pave it with books of varying thickness and size. She gave two or three sighs, for the stooping posture hurt her back, and for all her diplomacy she felt that she was growing old. The girl heard her as she entered the room, and was seized with one of those emotional impulses to which she could never attribute a cause. She only felt that the candle would burn better, the packing go easier, the world be happier, if she could give and receive some human love. The impulse had come before today, but never so strongly. She knelt down by her cousin's side and took her in her arms. Miss Bartlett returned the embrace with tenderness and warmth. But she was not a stupid woman, and she knew perfectly well that Lucy did not love her, but needed her to love. For it was in ominous tones that she said, after a long pause, "'Dearest Lucy, how will you ever forgive me?' Lucy was on her guard at once, knowing by bitter experience what forgiving Miss Bartlett meant. Her emotion relaxed, she modified her embrace a little, and she said, "'Charlotte, dear, what do you mean? As if I have anything to forgive.' "'You have a great deal, and I have a very great deal to forgive myself, too. I know very well how much I vex you at every turn." "'But no!' Miss Bartlett assumed her favourite role, that of the prematurely aged martyr. "'Ah, but yes! I feel that our tour together is hardly the success I had hoped. I might have known it would not do. You want some one younger and stronger and more in sympathy with you. I am too uninteresting and old-fashioned, only fit to pack and unpack your things." "'Please!' My only consolation was that you found people more to your taste, and were often able to leave me at home. I had my own poor ideas of what a lady ought to do, but I hope I did not inflict them on you more than was necessary. You had your own way about these rooms, at all events." "'You mustn't say these things,' said Lucy softly. She still clung to the hope that she and Charlotte loved each other heart and soul. They continued to pack in silence. "'I have been a failure said Miss Bartlett, as she struggled with the straps of Lucy's trunk instead of strapping her own. "'Failed to make you happy. Failed in my duty to your mother. She has been so generous to me. I shall never face her again after this disaster.' "'But mother will understand. It is not your fault, this trouble, and it isn't a disaster either.' "'It is my fault. It is a disaster. She will never forgive me, and rightly. For instance, what right had I to make friends with Miss Lavish?' every right. When I was here for your sake. If I have vexed you, it is equally true that I have neglected you. Your mother will see this as clearly as I do when you tell her." Lucy, from a cowardly wish to improve the situation, said, "'Why need mother hear of it?' "'But you tell her everything.' "'I suppose I do, generally.' "'I dare not break your confidence. There is something sacred in it. Unless you feel that it is a thing you could not tell her.' The girl would not be degraded to this. Naturally I should have told her, but in case she should blame you in any way, I promise I will not. I am very willing not to. I will never speak of it either to her or to any one." Her promise brought the long-drawn interview to a sudden close. Miss Bartlett pecked her smartly on both cheeks, wished her good-night, and sent her to her own room. For a moment the original trouble was in the background. George would seem to have behaved like a cad throughout. Perhaps that was the view which one would take eventually. At present she neither acquitted nor condemned him. She did not pass judgment. At the moment when she was about to judge him, her cousin's voice had intervened, and ever since it was Miss Bartlett who had dominated, Miss Bartlett who, even now, could be heard sighing into a crack in the partition wall, Miss Bartlett, who had really been neither pliable nor humble nor inconsistent. She had worked like a great artist. For a time, indeed for years, she had been meaningless, but at the end there was presented to the girl the complete picture of a cheerless, loveless world in which the young rush to destruction until they learn better, a shame-faced world of precautions and barriers which may avert evil, but which do not seem to bring good, if we may judge from those who have used them most. Lucy was suffering from the most grievous wrong which this world has yet discovered. 
diplomatic advantage had been taken of her sincerity, of her craving for sympathy and love. Such a wrong is not easily forgotten. Never again did she expose herself without due consideration and precaution against rebuff. And such a wrong may react disastrously upon the soul. The doorbell rang, and she started to the shutters. Before she reached them she hesitated, turned, and blew out the candle. Thus it was that, though she saw someone standing in the wet below, he, though he looked up, did not see her. To reach his room he had to go by hers. She was still dressed. It struck her that she might slip into the passage and just say that she would be gone before he was up, and that their extraordinary intercourse was over. Whether she would have dared to do this was never proved. At the critical moment Miss Bartlett opened her own door, and her voice said, "'I wish one word with you in the drawing-room, Mr. Emerson, please.' Soon their footsteps returned, and Miss Bartlett said, "'Good night, Mr. Emerson.' His heavy, tired breathing was the only reply. The chaperone had done her work. Lucy cried aloud, "'It isn't true. It can't all be true. I want not to be muddled. I want to grow older, quickly.' Miss Bartlett tapped on the wall. "'Go to bed at once, dear. You need all the rest you can get.' In the morning they left for Rome. Chapter 8 Medieval The drawing-room curtains at Windy Corner had been pulled to meet, for the carpet was new and deserved protection from the August sun. They were heavy curtains, reaching almost to the ground, and the light that filtered through them was subdued and varied. A poet, none was present, might have quoted, Life like a dome of many-colored glass, or might have compared the curtains to sluice gates lowered against the intolerable tides of heaven. Without was poured a sea of radiance. Within, the glory, though visible, was tempered to the capacities of man. Two pleasant people sat in the room. One, a boy of nineteen, was studying a small manual of anatomy and peering occasionally at a bone which lay upon the piano. From time to time he bounced in his chair and puffed and groaned, for the day was hot and the print small, and the human frame fearfully made, and his mother, who was writing a letter, did continually read out to him what she had written, and continually did she rise from her seat and part the curtains so that a rivulet of light fell across the carpet and make the remark that they were still there. "'Where aren't they?' said the boy, who was Freddy, Lucy's brother. I tell you, I'm getting fairly sick. For goodness sake, go out of my drawing room, then, cried Mrs. Honeychurch, who hoped to cure her children of slang by taking it literally. Freddy did not move or reply. I think things are coming to a head, she observed, rather wanting her son's opinion on the situation if she could obtain it without undue supplication. Time they did. I am glad that Cecil is asking her this once more. It's her third go, isn't it? Freddy, I do call the way you talk unkind. I didn't mean to be unkind. Then he added, But I do think Lucy might have got this off her chest in Italy. I don't know how girls manage things, but she can't have said no properly before, or she wouldn't have to say it again now. Of the whole thing, I can't explain. I do feel so uncomfortable. Do you indeed, dear? How interesting. I feel... Never mind. He returned to his work. Just listen to what I have written to Mrs. Vice. I said, Dear Mrs. Vice. Yes, mother, you told me. A jolly good letter. I said, Dear Mrs. Vice. Cecil has just asked my permission about it, and I should be delighted, if Lucy wishes it, but... She stopped reading. I was rather amused at Cecil asking my permission at all. He has always gone in for unconventionality, and parents know where and so forth. When it comes to the point, he can't get on without me. Nor me. You? Freddy nodded. What do you mean? He asked me for my permission also. She exclaimed, How very odd of him! Why so? Asked the son and heir. Why shouldn't my permission be asked? What do you know about Lucy or girls or anything? Whatever did you say? I said to Cecil, take her or leave her. It's no business of mine. What a helpful answer. But her own answer, though more normal in its wording, had been to the same effect. 
The bother is this, began Freddy. Then he took up his work again, too shy to say what the bother was. Mrs. Honeychurch went back to the window. Freddy, you must come. There they still are. I don't see you ought to go peeping like that. Peeping like that? Can't I look out of my own window? But she returned to the writing table, observing as she passed her son. Still page 322? Freddy snorted and turned over two leaves. For a brief space they were silent. Close by, beyond the curtains, the gentle murmur of a long conversation had never ceased. The bother is this. I have put my foot in it with Cecil most awfully. He gave a nervous gulp. Not content with permission, which I did give, that is to say, I said, I don't mind. Well, not content with that, he wanted to know whether I wasn't off my head with joy. He practically put it like this. Wasn't it a splendid thing for Lucy and for Windy Corner generally if he married her? And he would have an answer. He said it would strengthen his hand. I hope you gave a careful answer, dear. I answered no, said the boy, grinding his teeth. There, fly into a stew. I can't help it, had to say. I had to say no. He ought never to have asked me. Ridiculous child, cried his mother. You think you are so holy and truthful, but really it's only abominable conceit. Do you suppose that a man like Cecil would take the slightest notice of anything you say? I hope he boxed your ears. How dare you say no? Oh, do keep quiet, mother. I had to say no when I couldn't say yes. I tried to laugh as if I didn't mean what I said, and as Cecil laughed too and went away, maybe all right. But I feel my foot's in it. Oh, do keep quiet, though, and let a man do some work. No, said Mrs. Honeychurch, with the air of one who has considered the subject. I shall not keep quiet. You know all that has passed between them in Rome. You know why he is down here, and yet you deliberately insult him and try to turn him out of my house. Not a bit, he pleaded. I only let out I didn't like him. I don't hate him, but I don't like him. What I mind is that he'll tell Lucy. He glanced at the curtains dismally. Well, I like him, said Mrs. Honeychurch. I know his mother. He's good, he's clever, he's rich, he's well connected. Oh, you needn't kick the piano. He's well connected. I'll say it again if you like, he's well connected. She paused, as if rehearsing her eulogy, but her face remained dissatisfied. She added, And he has beautiful manners. I liked him till just now. I suppose it's having him spoiling Lucy's first week at home, and it's also something that Mr. Beebe said, not knowing. Mr. Beebe? said his mother, trying to conceal her interest. I don't see how Mr. Beebe comes in. You know Mr. Beebe's funny way when you never quite know what he means. He said, Mr. Vice is an ideal bachelor. I was very cute. I asked him what he meant. He said, Oh, he's like me, better detached. Couldn't make him say any more, but it set me thinking. Since Cecil has come after Lucy, he hasn't been so pleasant. At least, I can't explain. You never can, dear. But I can. You are jealous of Cecil, because he may stop Lucy knitting you silk ties. The explanation seemed plausible, and Freddy tried to accept it. But at the back of his brain there lurked a dim mistrust. Cecil praised one too much for being athletic. Was that it? Cecil made one talk in one's own way. This tired one. Was that it? And Cecil was the kind of fellow who would never wear another fellow's cap. Unaware of his own profundity, Freddy checked himself. He must be jealous, or he would not dislike a man for such foolish reasons. "'Will this do?' called his mother. "'Dear Mrs. Vice, Cecil has just asked my permission about it, and I should be delighted if Lucy wishes it. Then I put it at the top, and I have told Lucy so. I must write the letter out again. And I have told Lucy so.' But Lucy seems very uncertain, 
and in these days young people must decide for themselves i said that because i didn't want mrs vice to think us old-fashioned she goes in for lectures and improving her mind and all the time a thick layer of flue under the beds and the maid's dirty thumb marks where you turn on the electric light she keeps that flat abominably suppose lucy marries cecil would she live in a flat or in the country don't interrupt so foolishly where was i oh yes young people must decide for themselves i know that lucy likes your son because she tells me everything and she wrote to me from rome when he asked her first no i'll cross that last bit out it looks patronizing i'll stop it because she tells me everything or shall i cross that out too cross it out too said freddie mrs honeychurch left it in then the whole thing runs dear mrs vice cecil has just asked my permission about it and i shall be delighted if lucy wishes it and i have told lucy so but lucy seems very uncertain and in these days young people must decide for themselves i know that lucy likes your son because she tells me everything but i do not know look up cried freddie the curtains parted cecil's first movement was one of irritation he couldn't bear the honey church habit of sitting in the dark to save the furniture instinctively he gave the curtains a twitch and sent them swinging down their poles light entered there was revealed a terrace such as is owned by many villas with trees each side of it and on it a little rustic seat and two flower beds but it was transfigured by the view beyond for windy corner was built on the range that overlooks the sussex wald lucy who was in the little seat seemed on the edge of a green magic carpet which hovered in the air above the tremulous world cecil entered appearing thus late in the story cecil must be at once described he was medieval like a gothic statue tall and refined with shoulders that seemed braced square by an effort of the will and a head that was tilted a little higher than the usual level of vision he resembled those fastidious saints who guard the portals of a french cathedral well educated well endowed and not deficient physically he remained in the grip of a certain devil whom the modern world knows as self-consciousness and whom the medieval with dimmer vision worshipped as asceticism a gothic statue implies celibacy just as a greek statue implies fruition and perhaps this was what mr beebe meant and freddie who ignored history and art perhaps meant the same when he failed to imagine cecil wearing another fellow's cap mrs honeychurch left her letter on the writing-table and moved towards her young acquaintance oh cecil she exclaimed oh cecil do tell me i promisi sposi said he they stared at him anxiously she has accepted me he said and the sound of the thing in english made him flush and smile with pleasure and look more human i am so glad said mrs honeychurch while freddie proffered a hand that was yellow with chemicals they wished that they also knew italian for our phrases of approval and of amazement are so connected with little occasions that we fear to use them on great ones we are obliged to become vaguely poetic or to take refuge in scriptural reminiscences welcome as one of the family said mrs honeychurch waving her hand at the furniture this is indeed a joyous day i feel sure that you will make our dear lucy happy i hope so replied the young man shifting his eyes to the ceiling we mothers simpered mrs honeychurch and then realized that she was affected sentimental bombastic all the things she hated most why could she not be freddie who stood stiff in the middle of the room looking very cross and almost handsome i say lucy called cecil for conversation seemed to flag lucy rose from the seat she moved across the lawn and smiled in at them just as if she was going to ask them to play tennis then she saw her brother's face her lips parted and she took him in her arms he said steady on not a kiss for me asked her mother lucy kissed her also would you take them into the garden and tell mrs honeychurch all about it cecil suggested and i'd stop here and tell my mother 
Uh, we go with Lucy? Said Freddy, as if taking orders. Yes, you go with Lucy. They passed into the sunlight. Cecil watched them cross the terrace and descend out of sight by the steps. They would descend, he knew their ways, past the shrubbery and past the tennis lawn and the dahlia bed until they reached the kitchen garden, and there, in the presence of the potatoes and the peas, the great event would be discussed. Smiling indulgently, he lit a cigarette and rehearsed the events that had led to such a happy conclusion. He had known Lucy for several years, but only as a commonplace girl who happened to be musical. He could still remember his depression that afternoon at Rome, when she and her terrible cousin fell on him out of the blue and demanded to be taken to St. Peter's. That day she had seemed a typical tourist, shrill, crude, and gaunt with travel. But Italy worked some marvel in her. It gave her light and, which he held more precious, it gave her shadow. Soon he detected in her a wonderful reticence. She was like a woman of Leonardo da Vinci's, whom we love not so much for herself as for the things that she will not tell us. The things are assuredly not of this life. No woman of Leonardo's could have anything so vulgar as a story. She did develop most wonderfully day by day. So it happened that from patronizing civility he had slowly passed, if not to passion, at least to a profound uneasiness. Already at Rome he had hinted to her that they might be suitable for each other. It had touched him greatly that she had not broken away at the suggestion. Her refusal had been clear and gentle. After it, as the horrid phrase went, she had been exactly the same to him as before. Three months later, on the margin of Italy, among the flower-clad Alps, he had asked her again in bald, traditional language. She reminded him of a Leonardo more than ever. Her sunburnt features were shadowed by fantastic rock. At his words she had turned and stood between him and the light with immeasurable planes behind her. He walked home with her unashamed, feeling not at all like a rejected suitor. The things that really mattered were unshaken. So now he had asked her once more, and, clear and gentle as ever, she had accepted him, giving no coy reasons for her delay, but simply saying that she loved him and would do her best to make him happy. His mother, too, would be pleased. She had counseled the step. He must write her a long account. Glancing at his hand, in case any of Freddy's chemicals had come off on it, he moved to the writing table. There he saw, Dear Mrs. Weiss, followed by many erasures. He recoiled without reading any more, and after a little hesitation sat down elsewhere and penciled a note on his knee. Then he lit another cigarette, which did not seem quite as divine as the first, and considered what might be done to make Windy Corner Drawing Room more distinctive. With that outlook it should have been a successful room, but the trail of Tottenham Court Road was upon it. He could almost visualize the motor vans of Messrs. Shulbred and Messrs. Maple arriving at the door and depositing this chair, those varnished bookcases, that writing table. The table recalled Mrs. Honeychurch's letter. He did not want to read that letter. His temptations never lay in that direction, but he worried about it none the less. It was his own fault that she was discussing him with his mother. He had wanted her support in his third attempt to win Lucy. He wanted to feel that others, no matter who they were, agreed with him, and so he had asked their permission. Mrs. Honeychurch had been civil, but obtuse in essentials, while as for Freddy— He is only a boy, he reflected. I represent all that he despises. Why should he want me for a brother-in-law? The Honeychurches were a worthy family, but he began to realize that Lucy was of another clay, and perhaps—he did not put it very definitely— he ought to introduce her into more congenial circles as soon as possible. "'Mr. Beebe,' said the maid, and the new rector of Summer Street was shown in. He had at once started on friendly relations, owing to Lucy's praise of him in her letters from Florence. Cecil greeted him rather critically. "'I've come for tea, Mr. Vice. Do you suppose that I shall get it?' "'I should say so. Food is the thing one does get here. Don't sit in that chair. Young Honeychurch has left a bone in it.' Oof. I know, said Cecil. I know. I can't think why Mrs. Honeychurch allows it. For Cecil considered the bone and the maple's furniture separately. 
He did not realize that, taken together, they kindled the room into the life that he desired. "'I've come for tea and for gossip. Isn't this news?' "'News? I don't understand you,' said Cecil. "'News?' Mr. Beebe, whose news was of a very different nature, prattled forward. "'I met Sir Harry Otway as I came up. I have every reason to hope that I am first in the field. He has bought Sissy and Albert from Mr. Flack.' "'Has he indeed?' said Cecil, trying to recover himself. Into what a grotesque mistake had he fallen! Was it likely that a clergyman and a gentleman would refer to his engagement in a manner so flippant? But his stiffness remained, and, though he asked who Sissy and Albert might be, he still thought Mr. Beebe rather a bounder. "'Unpardonable question! To have stopped a week at Windy Corner and not to have met Sissy and Albert, the semi-detached villas that have been run up opposite the church. I'll set Mrs. Honeychurch after you.' "'I'm shockingly stupid over local affairs,' said the young man languidly. "'I can't even remember the difference between a parish council and a local government board. Perhaps there is no difference, or perhaps those aren't the right names. I only go into the country to see my friends and to enjoy the scenery. It is very remiss of me. Italy and London are the only places where I don't feel to exist on sufferance." Mr. Beebe, distressed at this heavy reception of Sissy and Albert, determined to shift the subject. "'Let me see, Mr. Vice. I forget. What is your profession?' "'I have no profession,' said Cecil. "'It is another example of my decadence. My attitude, quite an indefensible one, is that so long as I am no trouble to anyone, I have a right to do as I like. I know I ought to be getting money out of people or devoting myself to things I don't care a straw about, but somehow I've not been able to begin." "'You are very fortunate,' said Mr. Beebe. "'It is a wonderful opportunity, the possession of leisure.' His voice was rather parochial, but he did not quite see his way to answering naturally. He felt, as all who have regular occupation must feel, that others should have it also. "'I'm glad that you approve. I daren't face the healthy person. For example, Freddy Honeychurch. Ah, oh, Freddy's a good sort, isn't he? Admirable. The sort who has made England what she is. Cecil wondered at himself. Why, on this day of all others, was he so hopelessly contrary? He tried to get right by inquiring effusively after Mr. Beebe's mother, an old lady for whom he had no particular regard. Then he flattered the clergyman, praised his liberal-mindedness, his enlightened attitude towards philosophy and science. "'Where are the others?' said Mr. Beebe at last. "'I insist on extracting tea before evening service. "'I suppose Anne never told them you were here. "'In this house one is so coached in the servants the day one arrives. "'The fault of Anne is that she begs your pardon when she hears you perfectly, "'and kicks the chair-legs with her feet. "'The faults of Mary—' "'I forget the faults of Mary, but they are very grave. "'Shall we look in the garden?' "'I know the faults of Mary.' She leaves the dustpans standing on the stairs. The fault of Euphemia is that she will not, simply will not, chop the suet sufficiently small. They both laughed, and things began to go better. The faults of Freddy, Cecil continued. Ah, he has too many. No one but his mother can remember the faults of Freddy. Try the faults of Miss Honeychurch. They are not innumerable. She has none said the young man, with grave sincerity. "'I quite agree. At present she has none.' "'At present?' "'I'm not cynical. I'm only thinking of my pet theory about Miss Honeychurch. Does it seem reasonable that she should play so wonderfully and live so quietly? I suspect that one day she will be wonderful in both. The watertight compartments in her will break down, and music and life will mingle.' Then we shall have her heroically good, heroically bad. Too heroic, perhaps, to be good or bad." Cecil found his companion interesting. "'And at present you think her not wonderful, as far as life goes?' "'Well, I must say I've only seen her at Tunbridge Wells, where she was not wonderful, and at Florence. Since I came to Summer Street she has been away. You saw her, didn't you, at Rome and in the Alps?' Oh, I forgot, of course, you knew her before. No, she wasn't wonderful in Florence either, but I kept on expecting that she would be. 
In what way? Conversation had become agreeable to them, and they were pacing up and down the terrace. I could as easily tell you what tune she'll play next. There was simply the sense that she had found wings and meant to use them. I can show you a beautiful picture in my Italian diary. Miss Honeychurch as a kite, Miss Bartlett holding the string. Picture number two, the string breaks. The sketch was in his diary, but it had been made afterwards, when he viewed things artistically. At the time he had given surreptitious tugs to the string himself. But the string never broke? No. I mightn't have seen Miss Honeychurch rise, but I should certainly have seen Miss Bartlett fall. It has broken now, said the young man, in low, vibrating tones. Immediately he realized that of all the conceited, ludicrous, contemptible ways of announcing an engagement, this was the worst. He cursed his love of metaphor. Had he suggested that he was a star and that Lucy was soaring up to reach him? Broken? What do you mean? I meant, said Cecil stiffly, that she is going to marry me. The clergyman was conscious of some bitter disappointment, which he could not keep out of his voice. I am sorry. I must apologize. I had no idea you were intimate with her, or I should never have talked in this flippant, superficial way. Mr. Vice, you ought to have stopped me. And down the garden he saw Lucy herself. Yes, he was disappointed. Cecil, who naturally preferred congratulations to apologies, drew down his mouth at the corners. Was this the reception his action would get from the world? Of course he despised the world as a whole. Every thoughtful man should. It is almost a test of refinement. But he was sensitive to the successive particles of it which he encountered. Occasionally he could be quite crude. "'I am sorry. I have given you a shock,' he said dryly. "'I fear that Lucy's choice does not meet with your approval.' "'Not that. But you ought to have stopped me. I know Miss Honeychurch only a little, as time goes. Perhaps I oughtn't to have discussed her so freely with any one. Certainly not with you. You are conscious of having said something indiscreet? Mr. Beebe pulled himself together. Really, Mr. Vice had the art of placing one in the most tiresome positions. He was driven to use the prerogatives of his profession. No, I have said nothing indiscreet. I foresaw at Florence that her quiet, uneventful childhood must end, and it has ended. I realized dimly enough that she might take some momentous step. She has taken it. She has learnt—you will let me talk freely, as I have begun freely—she has learnt what it is to love, the greatest lesson, some people will tell you, that our earthly life provides." It was now time for him to wave his hat at the approaching trio. He did not omit to do so. "'She has learnt through you.' And if his voice was still clerical, it was now also sincere. Let it be your care that her knowledge is profitable to her. Grazia tanti, said Cecil, who did not like Parsons. Have you heard? shouted Mrs. Honeychurch as she toiled up the sloping garden. Oh, Mr. Beebe, have you heard the news? Freddy, now full of geniality, whistled the wedding march. Youth seldom criticizes the accomplished fact. Indeed, I have," he cried. He looked at Lucy. In her presence he could not act the parson any longer, at all events not without apology. Mrs. Honeychurch, I am going to do what I am always supposed to do, but generally I am too shy. I want to invoke every kind of blessing on them, grave and gay, great and small. I want them all their lives to be supremely good and supremely happy as husband and wife, as father and mother. And now I want my tea." "'You only asked for it just in time,' the lady retorted. "'How dare you be serious at Windy Corner?' He took his tone from her. There was no more heavy beneficence, no more attempts to dignify the situation with poetry or the scriptures. None of them dared or was able to be serious any more. An engagement is so potent a thing that sooner or later it reduces all who speak of it to this state of cheerful awe. Away from it, in the solitude of their rooms, Mr. Beebe, and even Freddy, might again be critical. But in its presence and in the presence of each other they were sincerely hilarious. 
It has a strange power, for it compels not only the lips but the very heart. The chief parallel to compare one great thing with another is the power over us of a temple of some alien creed. Standing outside, we deride or oppose it, or at the most feel sentimental. Inside, though the saints and gods are not ours, we become true believers, in case any true believer should be present. So it was that after the gropings and the misgivings of the afternoon, they pulled themselves together and settled down to a very pleasant tea-party. If they were hypocrites they did not know it, and their hypocrisy had every chance of setting and of becoming true. Anne, putting down each plate as if it were a wedding present, stimulated them greatly. They could not lag behind that smile of hers which she gave them ere she kicked the drawing-room door. Mr. Beebe chirruped. Freddy was at his wittiest, referring to Cecil as the fiasco, family-honored pun on fiancé. Mrs. Honeychurch, amusing and portly, promised well as a mother-in-law. As for Lucy and Cecil, for whom the temple had been built, they also joined in the merry ritual, but waited, as earnest worshippers should, for the disclosure of some holier shrine of joy. CHAPTER Nine, LUCY AS A WORK OF ART A few days after the engagement was announced, Mrs. Honeychurch made Lucy and her fiasco come to a little garden party in the neighborhood, for naturally she wanted to show people that her daughter was marrying a presentable man. Cecil was more than presentable. He looked distinguished, and it was very pleasant to see his slim figure keeping step with Lucy, and his long, fair face responding when Lucy spoke to him. People congratulated Mrs. Honeychurch, which is, I believe, a social blunder, but it pleased her, and she introduced Cecil rather indiscriminately to some stuffy dowagers. At tea a misfortune took place. A cup of coffee was upset over Lucy's figured silk, and though Lucy feigned indifference, her mother feigned nothing of the sort, but dragged her indoors to have the frock treated by a sympathetic maid. They were gone some time, and Cecil was left with the dowagers. When they returned he was not as pleasant as he had been. "'Do you go to much of this sort of thing?' he asked when they were driving home. "'Oh, now and then,' said Lucy, who had rather enjoyed herself. "'Is it typical of country society?' "'I suppose so. Mother, would it be?' "'Plenty of society,' said Mrs. Honeychurch, who was trying to remember the hang of one of the dresses. Seeing that her thoughts were elsewhere, Cecil bent towards Lucy and said, "'To me it seemed perfectly appalling, disastrous, portentous.' "'I am so sorry that you were stranded.' "'Not that, but the congratulations. It is so disgusting, the way an engagement is regarded as public property.' kind of waste place where every outsider may shoot his vulgar sentiment. All those old women smirking. One has to go through it, I suppose. They won't notice us so much next time. But my point is that their whole attitude is wrong. An engagement, horrid word in the first place, is a private matter and should be treated as such. Yet the smirking old women, however wrong individually, were racially correct. The spirit of the generations had smiled through them, rejoicing in the engagement of Cecil and Lucy, because it promised the continuance of life on earth. To Cecil and Lucy it promised something quite different—personal love. Hence Cecil's irritation, and Lucy's belief that his irritation was just. "'How tiresome!' she said. "'Couldn't you have escaped to tennis?' "'I don't play tennis—at least not in public.' The neighborhood is deprived of the romance of me being athletic. Such romance as I have is that of the Inglese Italianato. Inglese Italianato? E un diavolo incarnato. You know the proverb. She did not. Nor did it seem applicable to a young man who had spent a quiet winter in Rome with his mother. But Cecil, since his engagement, had taken to effect a cosmopolitan naughtiness which he was far from possessing. Well? Said he. I cannot help it if they do disapprove of me. There are certain irremovable barriers between myself and them, and I must accept them. We all have our limitations, I suppose, said wise Lucy. Sometimes they are forced on us, though, said Cecil, who saw from her remark that she did not quite understand his position. How? It makes a difference, doesn't it, whether we fully fence ourselves in, 
or whether we are fenced out by the barriers of others she thought a moment and agreed that it did make a difference difference cried mrs honeychurch suddenly alert i don't see any difference fences are fences especially when they are in the same place we were speaking of motives said cecil on whom the interruption jarred my dear cecil look here she spread out her knees and perched her card-case on her lap this is me that's windy corner the rest of the pattern is the other people motives are all very well but the fences come here we weren't talking of real fences said lucy laughing oh i see dear poetry she leant placidly back cecil wondered why lucy had been amused i tell you who has no fences as you call them she said and that's mr beebe a parson fenceless would mean a parson defenceless lucy was slow to follow what people said but quick enough to detect what they meant she missed cecil's epigram but grasped the feeling that prompted it don't you like mr beebe she asked thoughtfully i never said so he cried i consider him far above the average i only denied and he swept off on the subject of fences again and was brilliant now a clergyman that i do hate said she wanting to say something sympathetic a clergyman that does have fences and the most dreadful ones is mr eager the english chaplain at florence he was truly insincere not merely the manner unfortunate he was a snob and so conceited and he did say such unkind things what sort of things there was an old man at the bertolini whom he said had murdered his wife perhaps he had no why no he was such a nice old man i'm sure cecil laughed at her feminine inconsequence well i did try to sift the thing mr eager would never come to the point he prefers it vague said the old man had practically murdered his wife had murdered her in the sight of god hush dear said mrs honeychurch absently but isn't it intolerable that a person whom we're told to imitate should go round spreading slander it was i believe chiefly owing to him that the old man was dropped people pretended he was vulgar but he certainly wasn't that poor old man what was his name harris said lucy glibly let's hope that mrs harris there weren't no such person said her mother cecil nodded intelligently isn't mr eager a parson of the cultured type he asked i don't know i hate him i've heard him lecture on giotto i hate him nothing can hide a petty nature i hate him my goodness gracious me child said mrs honeychurch you blow my head off whatever is there to shout over i forbid you and cecil to hate any more clergymen he smiled there was indeed something rather incongruous in lucy's moral outburst over mr eager it was as if one should see the leonardo on the ceiling of the sistine he longed to hint to her that not here lay her vocation that a woman's power and charm reside in mystery not in muscular rant but possibly rant is a sign of vitality it mars the beautiful creature but shows that she is alive after a moment he contemplated her flushed face and excited gestures with a certain approval he forbore to repress the sources of youth nature simplest of topics he thought lay around them he praised the pine woods the deep lasts of bracken the crimson leaves that spotted the hurt bushes the serviceable beauty of the turnpike road the outdoor world was not very familiar to him and occasionally he went wrong in a question of fact mrs honeychurch's mouth twitched when he spoke of the perpetual green of the larch i count myself a lucky person he concluded when i'm in london i feel i could never live out of it when i'm in the country i feel the same about the country after all i do believe that birds and trees and sky are the most wonderful things in life and that the people who live amongst them must be the best it's true that in nine cases out of ten they don't seem to notice anything the country gentleman and the country laborer are each in their way the most depressing of companions yet they may have a tacit sympathy with the workings of nature 
which is denied to us of the town. Do you feel that, Mrs. Honeychurch? Mrs. Honeychurch started and smiled. She had not been attending. Cecil, who was rather crushed on the front seat of the Victoria, felt irritable, and determined not to say anything interesting again. Lucy had not attended either. Her brow was wrinkled, and she still looked furiously cross. The result, he concluded, of too much moral gymnastics. It was sad to see her thus blind to the beauties of an August wood. "'Come down, O oh maid, from yonder mountain height,' he quoted, and touched her knee with his own. She flushed again and said, "'What height?' "'Come down, O oh maid, from yonder mountain height. What pleasure lives in height?' the shepherd sang. "'In height and in the splendor of the hills. Let us take Mrs. Honeychurch's advice, and hate clergymen no more.' "'What's this place?' "'Summer Street, of course,' said Lucy, and roused herself. The woods had opened to leave space for a sloping triangular meadow. Pretty cottages lined it on two sides, and the upper and third side was occupied by a new stone church, expensively simple, a charming shingled spire. Mr. Beebe's house was near the church. In height it scarcely exceeded the cottages. Some great mansions were at hand, but they were hidden in the trees. The scene suggested a Swiss Alp rather than the shrine and centre of a leisured world, and was marred only by two ugly little villas, the villas that had competed with Cecil's engagement, having been acquired by Sir Harry Otway the very afternoon that Lucy had been acquired by Cecil. Sissy was the name of one of these villas, Albert of the other. These titles were not only picked out in shaded Gothic on the garden gates, but appeared a second time on the porches where they followed the semicircular curve of the entrance arch in block capitals. Albert was inhabited. His tortured garden was bright with geraniums and lobelias and polished shells. His little windows were chastely swathed in Nottingham lace. Sissy was to let. Three notice-boards, belonging to dorking agents, lolled on her fence and announced the not surprising fact. Her paths were already weedy. Her pocket-handkerchief of a lawn was yellow with dandelions. "'The place is ruined,' said the ladies mechanically. "'Summer Street will never be the same again.' As the carriage passed, Sissy's door opened and a gentleman came out of her. "'Stop!' cried Mrs. Honeychurch, touching the coachman with her parasol. "'Here's Sir Harry. Now we shall know. Sir Harry, pull those things down at once.' Sir Harry Otway, who need not be described, came to the carriage and said, "'Mrs. Honeychurch, I meant to. I can't, I really can't turn out Miss Flack.' "'Am I not always right? She ought to have gone before the contract was signed. Does she still live rent-free, as she did in her nephew's time?' "'But what can I do?' He lowered his voice. "'An old lady so very vulgar and almost bedridden.' "'Turn her out.' said Cecil bravely. Sir Harry sighed and looked at the villas mournfully. He had had full warning of Mr. Flack's intentions, and might have bought the plot before building commenced, but he was apathetic and dilatory. He had known Summer Street for so many years that he could not imagine it being spoilt. Not till Mrs. Flack had laid the foundation stone and the apparition of red and cream brick began to rise did he take alarm. He called on Mr. Flack, the local builder, a most reasonable and respectful man, who agreed that tiles would have made more artistic roof, but pointed out that slates were cheaper. He ventured to differ, however, about the Corinthian columns, which were to cling like leeches to the frames of the bow windows, saying that, for his part, he liked to relieve the façade by a bit of decoration. Sir Harry hinted that a column, if possible, should be structural as well as decorative. Mr. Flack replied that all the columns had been ordered, adding, "'And all the capitals different, one with dragons in the foliage, another approaching to the Ionian style, another introducing Mrs. Flack's initials, every one different. For he had read his Ruskin. He built his villas according to his desire, and not until he had inserted an immovable ant into one of them did Sir Harry buy. This futile and unprofitable transaction filled the night with sadness as he leant on Mrs. Honeychurch's carriage. He had failed in his duties to the countryside, and the countryside was laughing at him as well. He had spent money, and yet Summer Street was spoilt as much as ever. 
All he could do now was to find a desirable tenant for Sissy, someone really desirable. The rent is absurdly low, he told them. And perhaps I am an easy landlord. But it is such an awkward size. It is too large for the peasant class and too small for anyone the least like ourselves. Cecil had been hesitating whether he should despise the villas or despise Sir Harry for despising them. The latter impulse seemed the more fruitful. You ought to find a tenant at once, he said maliciously. It would be a perfect paradise for a bank clerk. Exactly, said Sir Harry excitedly. That is exactly what I fear, Mr. Weiss. It will attract the wrong type of people. The train service has improved, a fatal improvement to my mind. And what are five miles from a station in these days of bicycles? Rather a strenuous clock it would be, said Lucy. Cecil, who had his full share of medieval mischievousness, replied that the physique of the lower middle classes was improving at a most appalling rate. She saw that he was laughing at their harmless neighbor, and roused herself to stop him. "'Sir Harry,' she exclaimed, "'I have an idea. How would you like spinsters?' "'My dear Lucy, it would be splendid. Do you know any such?' "'Yes, I met them abroad.' "'Gentlewomen?' he asked tentatively. "'Yes, indeed, and at the present moment homeless. I heard from them last week. Miss Teresa and Miss Catherine Allen. I'm really not joking. They are quite the right people. Mr. Beebe knows them, too. May I tell them to write to you?' "'Indeed you may,' he cried. "'Here we are, with the difficulty solved already. How delightful it is! Extra facilities. Please tell them they shall have extra facilities, for I shall have no agent's fees. Oh, the agents, the appalling people they have sent me. One woman, when I wrote a tactful letter, you know, asking her to explain her social position to me, replied that she would pay the rent in advance. As if one cares about that. And several references I took up were most unsatisfactory. People swindlers are not respectable. And oh, the deceit! I have seen a good deal of the seamy side this last week. The deceit of the most promising people. My dear Lucy, the deceit! She nodded. My advice, put in Mrs. Honeychurch, is to have nothing to do with Lucy and her decayed gentlewoman at all. I know the type. Preserve me from people who have seen better days, and bring heirlooms with them that make the house smell stuffy. It's a sad thing, but I'd rather let to someone who is going up in the world than to someone who has come down. I think I follow you, said Sir Harry. But it is, as you say, a very sad thing. The Mrs. Allen aren't that, cried Lucy. Yes, they are said Cecil. I haven't met them, but I should say they were a highly unsuitable addition to the neighborhood. Don't listen to him, Sir Harry. He's tiresome. It's I who am tiresome, he replied. I oughtn't to come with my troubles to young people, but really I am so worried and Lady Otway will only say that I cannot be too careful, which is quite true, but no real help. Then may I write to my Mrs. Allen? Please. But his eye wavered when Mrs. Honeychurch exclaimed, Beware! They are certain to have canaries. Sir Harry, beware of canaries. They spit the seed out through the bars of the cage, and then the mice come. Beware of women altogether. Only let to a man. Really? He murmured gallantly, though he saw the wisdom of her remark. Men don't gossip over teacups. If they get drunk, there's an end to them. They lie down comfortably and sleep it off. If they're vulgar, they somehow keep it to themselves. It doesn't spread so. Give me a man, of course, provided he's clean. Sir Harry blushed. Neither he nor Cecil enjoyed these open compliments to their sex. Even the exclusion of the dirty did not leave them much distinction. He suggested that Mrs. Honeychurch, if she had time, should descend from the carriage and inspect Sissy for herself. She was delighted. Nature had intended her to be poor and to live in such a house. Domestic arrangements always attracted her, especially when they were on a small scale. Cecil pulled Lucy back as she followed her mother. Mrs. Honeychurch, 
he said. What if we two walk home and leave you? Certainly, was her cordial reply. Sir Harry, likewise, seemed almost too glad to get rid of them. He beamed at them knowingly, said, Aha, young people, young people, and then hastened to unlock the house. Hopeless vulgarian, exclaimed Cecil, almost before they were out of earshot. Oh, Cecil! I can't help it. It would be wrong not to loathe that man. He isn't clever, but really he is nice. No, Lucy. He stands for all that is bad in country life. In London he would keep his place. He would belong to a brainless club, and his wife would give brainless dinner parties. But down here he acts the little god with his gentility and his patronage and his sham aesthetics, and every one, even your mother, is taken in. All that you say is quite true, said Lucy, though she felt discouraged. I wonder whether, whether it matters so very much. It matters supremely. Sir Harry is the essence of that garden party. Oh, goodness, how cross I feel. How I do hope he'll get some vulgar tenant in that villa, some woman, so really vulgar that he'll notice it. Gentle folks, ugh, with his bald head and retreating chin. But let's forget him. This Lucy was glad enough to do. If Cecil disliked Sir Harry Otway and Mr. Beebe, what guarantee was there that the people who really mattered to her would escape? For instance, Freddy. Freddy was neither clever, nor subtle, nor beautiful, and what prevented Cecil from saying any minute? It would be wrong not to loathe Freddy. And what would she reply? Further than Freddy she did not go, but he gave her anxiety enough. She could only assure herself that Cecil had known Freddy some time, and that they had always got on pleasantly, except, perhaps, during the last few days, which was an accident, perhaps. Which way shall we go? she asked him. Nature, simplest of topics, she thought, was around them. Summer Street lay deep in the woods, and she had stopped where a footpath diverged from the high road. Are there two ways? Perhaps the road is more sensible, as we are got up smart. I'd rather go through the wood, said Cecil, with that subdued irritation that she had noticed in him all the afternoon. Why is it, Lucy, that you always say the road? Do you know that you have never once been with me in the fields or the woods since we were engaged? Haven't I? The wood, then, said Lucy, startled at his queerness, but pretty sure that he would explain later. It was not his habit to leave her in doubt as to his meaning. She led the way into the whispering pines, and sure enough he did explain before they had gone a dozen yards. I had got an idea, I dare say wrongly, that you feel more at home with me in a room. A room, she echoed, hopelessly bewildered. Yes, or at most in a garden, or on a road, never in the real country like this. Oh, Cecil, whatever do you mean? I have never felt anything of the sort. You talk as if I was a kind of poetess sort of person. I don't know that you aren't. I connect you with a view, a certain type of view. Why shouldn't you connect me with a room? She reflected a moment, and then said, laughing, do you know that you're right? I do. I must be a poetess, after all. When I think of you, it's always as in a room. How funny! To her surprise, he seemed annoyed. A drawing-room, pray? With no view? Yes, with no view, I fancy. Why not? I'd rather, he said reproachfully, that you connected me with the open air. She said again, Oh, Cecil, whatever do you mean? As no explanation was forthcoming, she shook off the subject as too difficult for a girl, and led him further into the wood, pausing every now and then at some particularly beautiful or familiar combination of the trees. She had known the wood between Summer Street and Windy Corner ever since she could walk alone. She had played at losing Freddy in it, when Freddy was a purple-faced baby, and though she had been to Italy, it had lost none of its charm. Presently they came to a little clearing among the pines. Another tiny green alp, solitary this time, and holding in its bosom a shallow pool. She exclaimed, The sacred lake! Why do you call it that? I can't remember why. I suppose it comes out of some book. It's only a puddle now, but you see that stream going through it. Well, a good deal of water comes down after heavy rains, and can't get away at once, and the pool becomes quite large and beautiful. Then Freddy used to bathe there. He is very fond of it. And you? He meant, 
Are you fond of it? But she answered dreamily. I bathed here too, till I was found out. Then there was a row. At another time he might have been shocked, for he had depths of prudishness within him. But now, with his momentary cult of the fresh air, he was delighted at her admirable simplicity. He looked at her as she stood by the pool's edge. She was got up smart, as she phrased it, and she reminded him of some brilliant flower that has no leaves of its own, but blooms abruptly out of a world of green. "'Who found you out?' "'Charlotte,' she murmured. She was stopping with us. "'Charlotte, Charlotte!' "'Poor girl!' She smiled gravely. A certain scheme, from which hitherto he had shrank, now appeared practical. "'Lucy?' "'Yes, I suppose we ought to be going,' was her reply. "'Lucy, I want to ask something of you that I have never asked before.' At the serious note in his voice, she stopped frankly and kindly towards him. "'What, Cecil?' "'Hitherto never, not even that day on the lawn when you agreed to marry me.' He became self-conscious, and kept glancing round to see if they were observed. His courage had gone. "'Yes?' "'Up to now I have never kissed you.' She was as scarlet as if he had put the thing most indelicately. "'No, more you have,' she stammered. "'Then I ask you, may I now?' "'Of course you may, Cecil. You might before. I can't run at you, you know.' At that supreme moment he was conscious of nothing but absurdities. Her reply was inadequate. She gave such a business-like lift to her veil. As he approached her, he found time to wish that he could recoil. As he touched her, his gold pince-nez became dislodged and was flattened between them. Such was the embrace. He considered, with truth, that it had been a failure. Passion should believe itself irresistible. It should forget civility and consideration and all the other curses of a refined nature. Above all, it should never ask for leave where there is a right of way. Why could he not do as any laborer or navvy, nay, as any young man behind the counter would have done? He recast the scene. Lucy was standing flower-like by the water. He rushed up and took her in his arms. She rebuked him, permitted him, and revered him ever after for his manliness. For he believed that women revere men for their manliness. They left the pool in silence, after this one salutation. He waited for her to make some remark which should show him her inmost thoughts. At last she spoke, and with fitting gravity. Emerson was the name, not Harris. What name? The old man's. What old man? That old man I told you about, the one Mr. Eager was so unkind to. He could not know that this was the most intimate conversation they had ever had.